and Sister Jane Garrity, our presidents here, thank you for being here, and our undergraduate dean, Laura uh, O'Toole, and, and others from the staff and faculty. Um, I'm going to be self-indulgent, um, because I actually know Mr. Mendoza from uh, many, many years ago. So um, I'm going to introduce him properly, and then I'll embarrass him, and he'll probably come up and embarrass me. But um, I, I want to welcome you. As I said, it's a special pleasure to introduce Lenny Mendoza and uh, tell you a little bit about him if you haven't read yet on the website or any of the press releases. He's a senior partner and director of firm knowledge in the San Francisco office of McKinsey and Company. He is on the shareholders council of McKinsey, which is its board of directors, and he oversees the McKin McKinsey Global Institute and the firm's communications, including McKinsey Quarterly. He has helped dozens of corporate, government, and not-for-profit clients solve their most difficult management challenges. Lenny has led several McKinsey research efforts. He has written and spoken extensively on globalization, corporate social responsibility, economic development, regulation, education, energy policy, health care, financial services, and corporate strategy. In other words, everything you're reading about these days in the newspaper. Lenny is the Chairman Emeritus of the Bay Area Council and is Chairman of the Economic Institute of the Bay Area. He also serves on the board of the New America Foundation, Common Cause, and the Bay Area Science and Innovation Consortium. He's a trustee for the Committee for Economic Development and a member of the Advisory Council for the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He serves on the board of Children Now and the California Business for Educational Excellence Foundation. Lenny received his MBA and certificate in public management from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and he holds an AB magna cum laude in economics from Harvard College. Lenny lives with his wife and two daughters on the Half Moon Bay Coast, south of San Francisco, where he is the founder and owner of the Half Moon Bay Brewing Company. Now, this is, this is the part where um, I get self-indulgent. It's one of my pet peeves when those who introduce a speaker use the platform to talk about themselves, but I'm going to indulge myself just this once to say just two or three things about how I came to know Lenny and how our families have intersected over the years. I know that many of our students are athletes here. How many of you are athletes? So you'll, you'll know where I'm going with this when, when I say a couple words about um, athletics. When I moved from a very small rural high school in California to a much larger one in the neighboring town, Sherlock High School, one of the first people I encountered was Lenny, and I met him in a most unpleasant way, which he surely doesn't remember. It was a pickup basketball game in gym class, and I recall my frustration when this slightly shorter but far more aggressive individual completely shut down my laid-back run-and-gun style. And, and that continued, actually, in my entire basketball career. No defense, all offense. Uh, it didn't matter that uh, I was on the varsity basketball team and Lenny was a baseball player. I can tell you, how, in fact, how glad I was that he wasn't on any of the opposing teams when we actually began the season. Instead, he was in the stands screaming like a maniac for all of us with the same intensity that he has brought to his education and his career as his resume and achievements clearly suggest. So before I sit down and let him speak, I'd like to give Lenny a couple of small tokens of appreciation for the generous gift of his time and his expertise in his willingness to swing through Newport on his way back to San Francisco. Now, despite the basketball story, um, I've gone with a different sport tonight. So I'm going to get these out. And uh, I'm really going to embarrass him. And, and I, doesn't embarrass me too much afterwards, but um, I've gone with baseball because he played baseball at our high school, and he's no doubt a part-time Red Sox fan, sort of, because of his four years in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I know he loves to go to Red Sox games, and I'm sure it's not just to see the A's play. Um, he's also part of a baseball dynasty in our hometown. Uh, his younger brother, Rob, whom my own older brother coached in high school, went on to play for the Phillies organization, before returning to take my brother's place as head coach at the high school. And I will brag where Lenny surely will not that uh, I'll also mention that his nephew Tommy was named MVP at the 2008 College World Series playing for Fresno State. So Lenny, thank you for being here and I've got a couple things to give you.
this is probably the last time in my career I'll have a high school uh, classmate come to Salve Regina to speak, but uh, there's the That's baseball team. Wow, so. beautiful. Yeah. 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 to wear that Salve Regina hat at uh, the baseball games at Sherlock High School since I know everyone there is a big fan of Salve Regina baseball. So it would be great. I look forward to it. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for uh, coming here tonight. It, it must be really slow on Thursday evenings in Newport if you're all sitting in this auditorium listening to Newport for a little while. So, but either that or it's really cold outside. But, Thank you for, uh, for coming, and I'm really excited to be here, and it will be fun to participate with you in an important conversation that you're all having. Uh, we are, without a doubt, in a really interesting time that when we look back, and historians are writing about this time, it will be one of the ones that they will talk about as a transition in the way the world works. And as you all know, for those of you that are, have been reading some of the ideas in Paul Hawkins' Blessed Unrest, we're all witness as we speak to a movement that whose potential for change is absolutely enormous and quite exciting. And this has made all the more acute an environment of economic crisis, the likes of which we've been experiencing for more than a year, and none of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes, and is not likely to turn around very quickly. But before I go into my formal remarks, there's another important reason that I'm here tonight, and I'd like to briefly highlight that and return the favor from my friend Dean. Um, the reason that I'm here, in addition to the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics about the role of the changing societal environment and how business and business leaders can engage in that, I'm here because my friend Dean Dielamot, your Vice President for Academic Affairs, invited me. Uh, as Dean said, we've known each other for a very long time. In fact, we just celebrated our 30th high school reunion this year, and that feels like it was yesterday. It felt like yesterday when Dean was pretending like he had a great jump shot, when in fact he spent more time hitting the back of the rim than through the hoop. But Dean was also uh, quite accomplished off the court. Uh, Dean was the editor of the newspaper, almost got kicked out of school for writing an underground newspaper that was actually the most entertaining newspaper of the times, and was a, an unbelievably uh, disciplined and thoughtful student, both as a writer and a thinker. And we all knew that Dean was going to go on to an academic career at that, same, at that point, and he was delighted to, for those of us who still spend time in our hometown, to walk around and listen to Dean's brother, Mark, who coaches with my brother, Rob, say great things about what Dean's doing. And so when Dean called and said, would you, become, would you be kind enough sometime when you're in the area to come through, I said, I'd be happy to. So Dean, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to get a chance to, to, to visit your university. Thanks for the compliment about the jump shot. <laughs> that was, the, uh, it was true. It was, it is true. So, but I, anyway, I, I'm happy to be here. Now, so the, on with the serious part. So. If you had any doubt about it, we are truly living in remarkable times. Uh, just this week, as you saw in, just last week, as you saw in much of the newspaper, we celebrated the 20th year of the tearing down of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. At that time, in 1989, we had pronouncements that we'd reached the end of history. And indeed, 1989, for many, was in fact the turning point. Many anticipated a world of of less and much more peaceful world, much less conflict. The quick and wide adoption of democratic ideas and the spread of market economies throughout the world. And on some of those accounts, we have been successful, but on many, there are fundamental challenges that remain. Democracy has spread in important ways throughout the world, yet the specter of authoritarian regimes still exists. It's true that millions of people have risen out of poverty, particularly in the last 20 years, though many millions still remain stuck at the so-called bottom of the pyramid, living less on less than a dollar or two a day. Markets have played a very important role in creating real wealth and raising the standards of living for millions, yet confidence in them has been shaken by recent events. The social movement at the heart of much of your discussions here and framed by Hawkins' work as a reaction to those developments. 
the environmental, human rights, and social justice elements of this discussion that we are now engaged in have a scope and scale that is truly impressive, reaching from the streets throughout the world to the classroom, to the boardroom, and to the highest levels of governments across the world. And perhaps most importantly, the discussion itself and the decisions that will emerge from it impact all of us, whether we're part of the dialogue or not. So I'd like to submit to you that these times invite and require action from each of us, not the least of which are my very high expectations for the contributions of those who are privileged to be in leadership positions in the business community and business leaders throughout the world have an especially important role to play. And as a business leader, that's what I want to talk to you about today. One of the elements that I really liked about Paul Hawkins' work is its evolutionary premise. My colleague Eric Beinhacker, in his best-selling book, The Origin of Wealth, teaches us about the power of evolution, not just in biological systems, but on institutions like markets and companies. He describes what he calls complexity economics, a relatively new and exciting paradigm. Complexity economics views the economy, economy differently than, say, classical economics, which had assumptions of fixed behavior and, quote, all things being equal. Well, we know that all things are not equal. Instead, Weinhacker describes a highly dynamic, constantly evolving system more akin to the brain, the internet, or an ecosystem than the static equilibrium presented by traditional economics. In fact, I'd like to submit to you that is this, this evolutionary process itself, the process of variation, selection, amplification, that acts upon designs of technology, social institutions, and businesses, that is the real driver of growth and better living conditions over time. It's this dynamic economic evolution that is taking us from living in caves with stone tools to an enormously complex $36.5 trillion global economy we have today. This growth has enabled millions to be lifted out of poverty, the advances in medicine, and a host of other wonderful life-affirming advances. And surely, in the face of this great creation of wealth over the last hundred years, we are still keenly aware of the inequities and promises that are yet to be met for many of those in the world. If we can have a better understanding of this complex evolution, and even better, how smart evolution helps create wealth, and we can better understand how businesses and governments can create more of it and do so in a way that are more considerate and aligned with the natural systems upon which all life depends. But it is very easy for any institution to get caught up in the day-to-day -day internal matters and pressing domestic day-to-day -day issues and lose sight of this wider, more complex world. To push our ideas forward and move the world forward, whether in academia and business circles and governments, we need to actively debate, challenge, and provide constructive criticism from institutions in the community around us. So I'm doubly pleased to be here today to be in the midst of that flow of ideas that you're all engaged with as students of this great university. But when I received the Dean's invitation to talk about the shifting and evolving role of business and society, there were some other reasons why I quickly said yes. The first is a topic that I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about tonight, which is business's role in public life. I see this question, the role that business leaders have to play and are playing and will play more importantly, as probably the most important long-term challenge to our thinking on building corporate strategies, an area which my firm McKinsey and I spend a lot of time on. The business role in public life is not an everyday, Monday morning business challenge. It's not something that every CEO wakes up and thinks about first thing in the morning. It's not in the category of problems that daily confront management, like what was there, what were my sales yesterday. And yet, business fulfilling its role and responsibilities in public life is a fundamental question that will help determine whether our societies succeed or fail, whether communities prosper or suffer, and whether we enjoy sustained and equitable economic growth and prosperity. So I have two principal normative questions that I hope to discuss with you today. The first is what, if any, role should CEOs and business leaders play in public life? 
I would make the case that business and its leaders have a clear, present, and vital role to play in both shaping and healing for the better the societies in which they live. The second question that builds on the first is, is there a role for business and society? If there is a role for business and society, and I'll suggest to you that there is, how should business leaders fulfill it? In other words, in a complex management world, how do executives bring social issues to the boardroom and the management table in a way that they align with and help accomplish their business objectives? So let me start with the first question. What role should business play in society? And add to that, what if any role does it have in tackling the most pressing social issues facing us today? To my mind, there's no question that business should be at the core of the efforts to tackle some of our biggest social problems. Be this concerns about our healthcare system that's dominating the debate in Washington today, with public education that should be more on the debate in Washington and state rooms, the environment and climate change, or even with our nation's vital national security. There are several reasons why I think that business should be engaged in these topics. First, it is quite clear that the success of the economy and the corporations that operate within it is determined in part by the effectiveness of the community in tackling these policy concerns. The economic environment is shaped, for example, by the health of our health care, the skills of our education system, and the sustainability of our pension provisions. And there are big problems with each of these in this country. In the U.S., we expect to spend up to 20% of our GDP on health care by 2016 the highest on the planet, but we still have 45 million citizens in this country and growing who are uninsured, and as a whole, we have no better health, health outcomes than nations who spend less than half of what we spend. Now, there's action afoot in Congress, as you all know, to change this. In fact, I was in Washington, D.C. this morning, engaged on that topic. The likely outcome is that we will have expanded care to more people, and that's important, but we're still not really wrestling with that fundamental cost question about how do we, ex how do we stem that expensive growth of spending <coughs> in the U.S. that exceeds that of every other country in the world. In education, which will be challenged for funding if we're continuing to spend such a large portion on health care, although we have the second highest spend per capita of any country in the world, we rank ninth in terms of high school graduates <coughs> and seventh in terms of those going on to higher education. Our pensions are substantially underfunded even before the economic collapse. Companies across the country are at least $450 billion short on their balance sheets of promises they've made to their employees. Level of personal savings are low. They were low before the, before the decline in wealth and the collapse of the housing markets, and individuals today are not prepared for retirement. At the same time, they're carrying record levels of personal, threat, personal debt. These trends, healthcare, education, and pension, are just three examples of big social issues that affect our economic competitiveness and our success in the global economy. And all of this takes place in the context of a globalized world where we're all more interconnected than ever. The experiences of the very poorest anywhere in the world are no longer divorced from the richest someplace else and vice versa. If the engines of social policy fail and these challenges remain unaddressed, society suffers and business suffers as our economy finds itself competing with one arm tied behind its back. But it's not always been recognized that it is in the interest of business to pitch in and help tackle these troubles that face our communities. These issues have too often been left to others. And it's also not been recognized that business and business leaders in many cases have the problem solving skills, the drive, the innovation, the technology and the experiences that can help solve these critical social and economic issues. It's clear to me that neither government alone nor even with civil society can solve these crises. And it's my contention that business leaders are vital to solving these problems and it's in their self-interest to do so. Second, there's a perception in society even more so today, that business has been ignoring the good of society in favor of its own interests, hoping to undermine trust in institutions. In a number of spheres, the activities of companies have been presented as the root cause of social problems. The case studies are well known. In some instances, some companies have produced products or services 
or behaved in ways that are damaging to those who purchase them or use them or have been damaging to society as a whole. And in some cases, there have been sub substantial costs to communities or society as a whole from the activities of inappropriate company behavior. And although the perception of all, that all business behavior is, is detrimental is undoubtedly unfair, the actions of those who cause damage shapes the reputation of corporate America in general. In the U.S., for example, more, more than 70% of executives told us recently that they viewed the overall contribution of large corporations, public and private, to the public good as mostly or somewhat positive, 70%. However, for consumers, the figure was just over 40%. In Europe, it's closer to 30%. This places business at the bottom of the pile of institutions that people trust, below NGOs, below small businesses, below the UN below unions, below media, and below even the government when it comes to perceptions or contributions to the public good. I believe that disengagement on the part of business from social issues, the notion that the business of business is business and society's broader concerns are not relevant to it, has reinforced this position of weakness for business. And for the individual firm, the risk to reputation to its customer base of remaining outside of society's broader conversation or entering it too late are equally substantial. For businesses that fail to grasp this, the hazards are great. Consumer and employees are already rejecting in large numbers the firms that they perceive to run roughshod over society. Our own research has found that more than half of consumers in the US, Canada, Germany, China, India, Brazil have refused to buy products and services in response to a company's behavior that they consider to be against the best interests of society. A dramatic personal witness of the movements that Paul Ockham described. This capacity to punish companies that are perceived to break the rules is fueled by the increasing capacity of the individual citizen or small groups to hold corporations to account on an issue. They can argue, make an argument that they can campaign around if they really want to mobilize. Through the internet and other social media, Highly effective campaigns have been waged against companies in financial services, retail, and consumer goods. Again, I believe that the firm that is actively engaged in society will do so will do much better in this context of increased accountability and expectations. But now there is some good news. Most executives, at least at the senior level, actually do get this. The CEOs that I talk to understand that business has a stake in society functioning effectively, that they have something to offer to the communities in which they work, and that consumers are going to reject those firms that they believe take their social responsibilities too lightly. Our surveys over a number of years consistently show that more than 80% of executives around the world believe that business should both generate returns to investors and balance this with contributions to the greater public good. For example, executives clearly understand that a dysfunctional educational system means a shallow tool, pool of talent and employees going forward. That a broken healthcare system leaves their employees facing uncertainty and serious consequences. And in fact, questions the very success of the performance of their business. They're also coming to understand the fundamental concept that these matters are so important that they should sit at the heart of corporate strategy not just some sideline administrative function. Social issues like the health of the US, the evolution of the US healthcare system, don't just shape a corporation strategy. They increasingly are going to determine whether a company or an industry succeeds or fails. And they should be addressed in the context of the firm's of a firm's longer term strategy. A number of firms are also seeing the positive market opportunities that arise from engaging in social issues. New strategies can emerge from learning and through conversations with other sectors and stakeholders. Witness, for example, the gains with delivering products that dramatically outcompete their rivals on environmental or social friendliness in places like Whole Foods. Our research has also uncovered some surprising attitudes among executives in regard to their personal roles in public life. In a poll of U.S. executives, we found that 90% of senior U.S. business executives believe that business leaders should play a role in addressing public issues. Amazingly, nearly half of them said that executives should play a, reader, a leadership role in doing so. But 
only 15% of them actually said that they play that role themselves. So if executives understand that there's a stake for their business on these issues and believe it's their responsibility to do it, why aren't we seeing a wave of executives offering their services to address the nation's most pressing policy challenges? Why aren't more companies making goods and services that tackle some of the biggest problems facing the planet? Well, put simply, too often, businesses fall down on this front in, the areas because, in these areas because of pervasive incentive challenges and by, and by association with that unfocused implementation. While executives buy the concept, too often they're pushed to satisfy expectations that run counter to these goals, or they simply fail to understand what consumers and employees really want. Our studies find that executives sometimes do fail to understand consumers' priorities. When asked to identify the most important issues facing the U.S., executives and consumers don't align around the same list, with the exception of climate change, which was the most important topic on both groups' lists. Consequently, the topics that matter most to consumers often fail to hit the corporate radar, which means both missed opportunities and risk, and higher risk. In missing this, executives fail to build the relationships and insights that they need to succeed in this complex environment. More deeper engagement around this with the community in which they operate is also a big missed opportunity. Companies should engage, should not get engaged after they hit a rough spot, as is sometimes the case. This is something that businesses need to do because it makes sense. It builds trust. It creates a reservoir of goodwill to draw upon when you do hit a rough spot. And I can assure you, businesses all eventually hit some sort of rough spot. External shocks rarely arise without warning. Businesses that scan the horizon, the longer term horizon for risks, and actively engage in efforts to address social issues are better equipped and protected against trends that might punish their competitors. Further to all of this, our most recent findings show that management engage in, engagement and action on important social environmental issues are seen by the investment community as a sign of strong and forward-looking management teams. And still, too few, too few companies reach out and engage governments and civil society and build the contacts and links that they need that will give them credibility and a place at the table on the important conversations. This is a mistake in political perceptiveness, because although businesses certainly should avoid political meddling and be cautious about narrowly focused lobbying, they should speak out in broader public policy debates where business is a full partner. Those with nothing to hide in their activities gain much from active engagement. But too often, business leaders also fail to acquire the elements and the skill set needed to tackle these challenges. This is in part a problem with business education, which has placed too little emphasis on a new set of skills that business leaders need today. Tools for understanding the public sector and the social sector, for speaking their language, for feeling comfortable in operating in a policy environment. This is what Professor Mandel of the Harvard Kennedy School calls tri-sector competence, business public and social. We need to teach and encourage our leaders to do this before they jump into the fire. Perhaps more egregious, senior executives often fail to get social issues into their strategy. Understanding that is where social issues belong. They still push social issues off to a corporate social responsibility group or a public relations department who lock the clout and resources to make a difference. They don't focus on the long-term health of their business focusing too often on short-term results that camouflage the kind of issues I'm talking about today. So I began this conversation by saying that I discussed the case for business and leaders, their leaders, in having a clear, present, and vital role to play in society. Let me talk for a moment now about the second question, how business leaders themselves should fulfill that role. And I hope this can be a starting point for a little bit of discussion when I'm finished in a couple minutes. What can we do to help companies and the people that lead them build social and environmental issues into their corporate strategies? So here's a few ideas. First, companies should focus their attention on these matters squarely on the shoulders of the chief executive officer. It should be the CEO who manages social issues as the one who's clearly the ultimate arbiter of corporate strategy. 
as soon as the social issues get delegated down the organization, they lose attention and trouble will follow. Focusing on the CEO means ensuring that he or she and their executive team have the right external network to be able to function as public leaders. They need to know the key public sector leaders, key editors in the media, crucial social sector leaders, heads of the unions and the NGOs that matter to their business. As noted, this is particularly important for times of discord, as we have now, when long-standing relationships built over an extended period can help bridge divides, but they're also useful for times of collaboration when all parts of society need to rally together on large shared problems. Second, business leaders also need to know their peers and to work with them. It's undeniably tough for any business or business leader to take a stand on a big issue of public interest. No one pretends that it's easy to put your head above the parapet, <coughs> excuse me, or put your company's name in the public scrutiny. What is clear from our research is that executives find it a lot easier to weigh in on a debate when there are other businesses doing the same thing, as a united business voice rather than as a lone campaigner. Just recently, companies like Nike, Pacific Gas and Electric and others have left the U.S. Chamber of Commerce over its recalcitrant stand on climate change, more likely to follow. Third, <coughs> excuse me, business leaders need to understand the limits of what they and their companies can do. They need a clear perspective on what innovation in public policy problem solving they can contribute and the skills and technologies that they have that might be useful. They shouldn't overreach but nor should they check out altogether under the misapprehension that such a question should be left to politicians or others. Fourth, the corporate world should encourage business schools to prepare MBAs for the challenge of being a public leader. Few schools do enough at the moment to prepare MBAs for the reality of leading a corporation or playing that representative role where the executive will be required to contribute to the public discourse. Schools should do more to give students exposure to the kinds of issues, the sets of skills, and the network that are a requirement for firms to be able, and their leaders to be able to navigate society successfully. And fifth and finally, business should focus on fixing some of the obstructions to building social issues into strategy. Executives identify competing strategy priorities, challenges of implementation across their businesses, and a lack of recognition in the capital markets as barriers as to why they don't engage more broadly in society. All these issues need to be overcome if companies are not to expose themselves to the risks of being left out of the conversation. None of this is easy. Executives are under enormous pressure. Politics is generally not their field, and there are no easy answers to these big problems. But when you consider the risks of business disengagement, that it becomes clear that we face a substantial problem. Instead of an actively engaged, problem-solving private sector, we are left with a debilitating void, a failure of corporate leadership. Action will, however, undoubtedly be colored now by the current global financial environment. At a time of financial crisis where trust in business along with share prices have plummeted to unprecedented lows, Ensuring that the value of this type of corporate activity is clear becomes a serious priority. Okay. It's too easy and too short-sighted to cut investments in these areas now. We have very clear evidence that business playing a role on key social activities creates real tangible value for them when measured against financial criteria. We recently carried out a study with the Boston College for Boston College's Center for Corporate Citizenship along with IBM, and, and in that process interviewed 135 executives from finance, strategy, HR, and corporate responsibility from 20 different companies across 11 industries in, the Europe, in Europe and the US. Our findings were that half of the financial executives and CFOs interviewed believe that companies' social and environmental issues drive more than 5% of their overall company value. And while companies have create demonstrated value from their social initiatives, very few of them communicate that value to the markets. Social and environmental issues from the company standpoint create value 
among the four areas traditionally valued by the market, growth, return on capital, management of risks, and management quality. Communicating along these lines in a concerted manner can better quantify and convey the financial impact of environmental, social, and governance issues to the markets. There's a real opportunity for corporate responsibility professionals and financial executives to broaden their expertise to fill this gap, cementing the strategic nature of these business activities as something that's core to the actual ongoing financial success of the business. These findings clearly demonstrate that the financial markets and the market makers do recognize the value of that, these activities, but without clear information, markets don't adequately take this into account when they value companies. In the end, these issues will be about measurement and communication. But few companies adequately measure how their social and environmental issues stack up. Even fewer communicating in a language that resonates with the financial community. And as we all know, what gets measured is treasure. We need to get more rigorous about this, especially in the light of recent events. Moving from talking about the business value of this activity to real hard financial value creation measures. IBM, Campbell Soup, and others do some of this. More must do so in order to maintain their relevance and traction, especially in today's heightened scrutiny. So I began by talking about how easy it is for any institution to get caught up in the internal affairs, pressing domestic and day-to-day -day concerns and lose sight of the wider world around them. For me, and for what we, what we are seeing increasingly in the clients that we're working with, it's vital that business avoid this outcome. Business needs to be actively involved in the community around them and be an important part and necessary part of the blessed unrest that Paul Hawk talked about. This movement can change the world for the better and business needs to be part of it. Simply stated, it matters for business success and the success of the society as a whole that we actually tackle these issues. I look forward to engaging with you for a little bit longer in any Q&A that you might have in the time remaining, and I thank you very much for your time and thoughts.